Hello, team, and welcome to another episode of Bureaucracy. I am so excited to be here today with Joe Dressen, and we are going to be talking about what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Joe is the Senior Program Associate from the Keenan Institute at the Wilson Center. So excited to have him. Joe, first of all, before we get started, what are you drinking? So I'm drinking the mass-produced Youngling Lager, but let's not drink it in a can. Let's drink it in the Keep Calm and Study Russia Kennedy Institute Milk. Love go. it. It's perfect. I am once again drinking a Blue Moon because this is what I have in my apartment, and so that means we're going to be drinking it until it's gone. Let's dive into it. All right. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, again, my name is Joe Dresden. I'm a senior program associate at the uh, Kennan Institute. Uh, it's uh, co-founded by the famous uh, ambassador uh, to Russia, George Kennan. He's the guy who uh, wrote the long telegram and the X article and is the author of what's known as the containment policy, which basically guided uh, American foreign policy towards the Soviet Union for over four decades. Interesting. Um, yeah, we are part of the uh, Wilson Center. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center is a kind of a think tank in Washington, D.C., but we are, unlike regular think tanks, we are chartered by Congress as the official presidential memorial to Woodrow Wilson. He's the only president to hold a PhD. And so That's rather than... That's not concerning build... at all. <laughs> okay. Well, it, 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 it deserves mem uh, memorialization. Absolutely. It? 100%. Just, just the one. Don't know what happens when we do the second. But yeah. until then, uh, we our, our charter is basically to bring together policymakers and academic experts, sort of like Wilson did it himself, awesome. with the hope and anticipation that better research and better policy might result from you know, great minds getting together and thinking through the world's uh, and the country's biggest problems. Absolutely. Uh, as, as a congressionally chartered institution, we are uh, strictly nonpartisan, and that's not bipartisan, it's nonpartisan. Uh, so our job is to should I say produce more light than heat when it comes to you know discussions of the day like the one we're going to talk about? Absolutely. Uh, and which also brings me to the uh, sort of uh, personal disclaimer that what I'm talking about now are my personal views and are not those of the uh, you know Ken Institute or the Wilson Center or the U.S. government or anybody. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Thank okay. you for giving that disclaimer. Um, as people who listen to this podcast know, I am a raging liberal and will let Bernie Sanders do whatever he wanted to me. However, I think it is so important to be able to have these conversations and just kind of get down to the facts and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into it. What is okay. going on? It feels like we're kind of headed to a World War III, which I don't know about you, but I feel like my generation is very much not prepared for that as we are catapulted by a our desire for antidepressants and oat milk. So what's going on with Russia and Ukraine? Talk to us. How did this happen? Sure. Well, I mean, so I'm from the generation that actually still lived with the Cold War. Right. Uh, you know, I was in high school, uh, you know, as, as the Soviet Union was careening towards uh, perestroika and then in college when it uh, collapsed. So, yeah, I was a Russian major, and the, the country collapsed. And I was like, okay, what do I do now? Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that was only my problem. Uh, so the real problem today is, you know, what's going on with Russia and Ukraine? And, well, let's go back to 1991. First thing to say is that Russian nationalists were not very pleased to lose the empire of the Russian Empire, which they presided over as the center of the Soviet Union. Uh, basically, they lost a lot of land, a lot of territory that had been built up over centuries by the Russian Empire and controlled from Moscow. And the biggest loss, to their mind, was Ukraine. Interesting. Uh, Russians really feel a uh, common identity with, you know, I've heard of Slavic identity, the Slavs, the Slavs in Ukraine, the Slavs in Belarus, the Slavs in Russia, they all feel that they're sort of one common people. And uh, if you ask President Putin, uh, he will say that, you know, Putin's, uh, Ukraine is not even a real country. It's, it's, these are, these are individuals who never really had independence until 1991 before. It's not entirely true, but it's, it's largely true. And there are all these sort of cultural, religious, uh, intermarried connections that go back a thousand years. Gotcha. So that, that's literally a thousand. Some people say a thousand years is sort of hyperbole. No, this means like literally no. a thousand years. So yeah. there's a lot of history there. A lot of history. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And so it seems like Putin has a grudge and is not over the fact that the USSR uh, dissipated in 1991. And... Mm -hmm. 
I know that there's been some issue, Ukraine and Russia fighting um, came up not too long ago, in 2014 with Crimea, and now it's kind of back again, but this time with Ukraine. When did this conflict really start to accelerate sure. during this time okay. now, during the period that we are in now? I understand. So, you know, Putin called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest uh, catastrophe of the 20th century. And a lot of Russia watchers at the time thought that he meant catastrophes in terms of like a volcano exploding rather than some sort of tragic blunder. And I, I doubt that today that, that view still holds up, right? I think a lot of people are thinking maybe Putin meant, meant it a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, so the, the current conflict that we're all seeing on the news today, that really started in 2014, as you mentioned, with Russia's annexation of Crimea and uh, the, the separatist war that he ginned up in Ukraine's eastern provinces. Uh, that All of that happened as a reaction to a demonstration leading to the evacuation of a pro-Russian president in charge of Ukraine at the time, a guy named Yanukovych, who was a straight-up corrupt gangster type guy who was trying to play Russia off the West in terms of what better package he could get for, not just for his people, but for himself personally, what would benefit him the self the most. And he went back and forth too much and he gave the Ukrainian people too much of a hope that there would be unification with the EU. They really liked the idea of joining uh, the European Union, which was stable and prosperous and democracy, uh, democratic governments, et cetera, et cetera, with all the personal liberty versus what they were seeing happening in Russia. And even in by 2014, Russia is becoming a much different place than Russia was in the, tw in the, in the aughts, if we can call that decade that, um, where, you know, Russia was on the rebound. It was, the economy was growing, that individuals had very much personal liberties, but uh, sort of collective political rights were curtailed. Uh, but by 2014, that uh, curtailment of rights started to encroach on the individual liberties. And it was okay. just you know, a politically complicated time. Uh, when the pro-Russian leader left, that's when uh, Putin decided that, you know, heck with this, I'm going to go in, I'm going to take over this territory called Crimea, which is very largely populated by ethnic Russians who are military veterans who retired there. Interesting. But was, yeah, but it's also, you know, home to like, you know, a very large Tartar community that have been deported by Stalin to some remote steps, you know, remote steps near Kazakhstan and so only made their way back in the 80s. It's just so complicated a uh, history. Fascinating. Here. Is Crimea, Crimea is its own separate entity and was not part of Ukraine or was part Crimea of was totally part of Ukraine. Oh, okay. Uh, it was, well, it was part of Ukraine because uh, sometime in the, you know, 19, late 1950s or 60s or so, uh, you know, uh, Premier Khrushchev, reattached the territory of Crimea from Russia to Ukraine. And, you know, at the time it was the Soviet Union. Uh, these were, right. you know, sort of borders in concept. It really didn't mean anything. Yeah, yeah. Sort of we're like, take yeah, one we'll take this one, you'd have that one. You know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, some scholars have debated that, you know, Khrushchev did that so that the cost of rebuilding Crimea from the devastation of World War II would fall on the Ukrainian budget rather than the Russian budget. Gotcha. So there's that line Anyhow, uh, when, you know, Ukraine gained its independence in 1991, along with the other 14 republics of the Soviet Union, they had Crimea. And it had, you know, the, the Russian military base on Crimea, a big naval military base. It's basically Russia's uh, most important warm water naval facility. And they kept it, you know, not unlike we kept Guantanamo Bay. Right. <laughs> when, when, Just to have it in a back Cuba pocket, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> this, this, is what, this is what the big countries do, right? Yeah. Uh, they have ports in different places. Um, but, you know, there had never been an issue before with Ukraine threatening to take over that military base or anything like that. And especially in the first days of the new uh, government in Kiev in 2014, it's not like they're going to come down and take the, you know, that was not their first, you know, item of business on the agenda, right? It's right. kick the Russians out of the naval base. Far from it. But Putin decided that there was a threat of that happening. Didn't want to lose the base, and he launched a short, quick, victorious little war with the little green men you might have heard of. Yep. Uh, they went in, they took over sort of you know various government buildings very quickly, uh, and then they yeah. held a referendum, which you know, take it for what you will, ninety-five percent of the population voted to join Russia. That's like saying order. I have a whole army of fans, and ninety-five percent of them are my family. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 not 
who votes, it's who counts the votes, right? That's right. Uh, well, kind of a uh, apocryphal saying that you could ascribe to Stalin. Well, yeah, Putin took that to heart, counted the votes, and 95% in the referendum said, let's join Russia. Hmm. So that's how, you Interesting. know. Interesting. That's how Russia got Crimea. Okay. And then they also launched separatist wars in uh, the Ukrainian uh, provinces of Luhansk and the Donbass. Uh, and, you know, that conflict ra rages today. It doesn't rage. It sort of simmers, right? They're, they're literally in trenches and they fight back and forth every now and then. And But over the last eight years, there have been 14,000 casualties from that wow. conflict. It's, it's a lot, right? Yeah, no. Uh, I would a, say one is, is a lot. That feels excessive. <laughs> Yeah, fourteen thousand is a lot, yeah. uh, especially for the you know it, it's not it's it's a, it's a stalemate. For a but it's conflict. a stalemate yeah. that sort of profits Russia uh, from Putin's perspective in keeping uh, Ukraine less than stable. Gotcha. So Pierre said this kind of current conflict started what we're discussing now. Sorry, maybe two months ago, where Russia started making kind of advanced moves, getting yeah. up the military, becoming a threat. Why yeah. now? What went on that Putin was? Like, this is the time that I'm going to try to start a war. Well, a lot of people have tried to get into Putin's head to figure out why he does what he does. And it usually does not go very well for the person yeah. who makes the predictions, right? Uh, in fact, you know, I'm going to make predictions uh, on this podcast that, you know, it's going to air days later and I might look like an idiot. But that's okay. <laughs> I'm willing to do it because, you know, we'll put a disclaimer keep on calm. It. Yeah. Keep calm and drink your beer. Right. That's right. So Putin himself claims that Russia is alarmed by the prospect of Ukraine joining NATO. Right. Which Russia, but Russia has made Ukraine joining NATO impossible because they occupy portions of Ukrainian territory. And a condition of joining NATO is that a candidate nation must have, must be secure within its borders. Interesting. So already, de facto, it's impossible for them to join NATO. Right. Maybe a more realistic assessment is that Putin says he's concerned by NATO weaponry in Ukraine. And that these are these are the anti-tank missiles that we've shipped over there, and other defensive armaments uh, that we've applied that we supplied them in recent years uh, in response to the ongoing, you know, conflict uh, in Ukraine's east. So you know, you could argue perhaps that Ukraine is like sort of coming at de facto member of the alliance because there's data weaponry in the country. Interesting. But you know, the idea. But but back up from that and, and consider what do you think of the idea that Putin is really concerned about NATO? rolling into Russia, yeah. right? When Russia has nukes, it, it sort of defies the imagination. No, now, it sounds know, like it. Putin got bored. Euphoria wasn't enough for him, and he's decided that he needs something bigger and better to get going. Well, all right, that takes me to sort of, you know, reason uh, number three. And perhaps the biggest unspoken concern that Putin might have is the prospect of Ukraine, finally, after 30 years of sort of very corrupt governments, that shift pro-West, pro-Russia, but always very corrupt for the oligarchs in charge of the place. After 30 years of independence, it might start to get its act together politically and, and conduct successful reforms and eventually emerge as a peaceful and prosperous nation where its citizens enjoy ties with the West, political economic freedoms and you know rainbows and unicorns. Uh, and all of this right next door uh, to Russia, which Putin himself claims is the same people, right? Right. And then, you know, then Russian people might start to wonder, well, why do these Ukrainians, who we've always considered like our inferior younger brothers, why do they have it so good? And we're stuck over here, you know, living under Putin's regime. And he's been here like forever, for 22 years. There are people who are, you know, coming into adulthood now have known nothing but Putin. Uh, and, you know, he's getting a little stale, I guess. And... It's even more stale if uh, your neighbors, who are very much like you and are like, like related to you, uh, are faring much better. Or having a much uh, better time. And, and, yeah, yeah. That, so that that might be the actual real concern Interesting. for Putin to sort of sort of mess that up and and sort of bring Ukraine back into the fold. Interesting. All right. I read recently that yeah the Ukrainian president was a comedian and actor. Yeah. Yeah. See, uh, see, mom, there is hope for me. <laughs> Ukraine's John Stewart, right? Love it. He had a very popular comedy where he actually played the president of Ukraine. Look at that uh, irony in the making. I know, right? That's some like uh, Simpsons foreshadowing, you know. You know, the Simpsons has not bad foreshadowing of no, events. No, it's that incredible. Transpire. It's terrifying. Yeah, I think they're the you Illuminati. Google, you can Google that on YouTube or something, right? And, <laughs> and, and find uh, Yel a Simpson pr predictions of Russia that come true, oh my God. and the United States. So. 
Well, I, I will just want to bring up the other, you know, possible reason is that maybe Russia just likes doing this stuff during the Olympics because they invaded Georgia during the 2008 Olympics uh, in Beijing and they took over Crimea during the Sochi Olympics in 2014. And now we're back to the Beijing Winter Olympics in 2022. And yeah, we have 150,000 troops massed on uh, Ukraine's borders to the north, to the east, and uh, you know, with naval ships to the south. So it's they're fenced in, and it's a it's a it's a terrifying prospect. But the Ukrainians are really sort of they've been living this with eight, for eight years. So wow. their whole mantra is just well, just keep going, keep calm, and carry on. Yeah. Why the Olympics? Why does Putin got to ruin a good thing? You know. Who knows? Who knows? It could be chance, but you know, three three times is a trend, I guess. But, you know, so. the third time hasn't happened yet, so fingers crossed. I know, hopefully not. Although uh, some other person was telling me that they think something might happen with the end of the Olympics, and that will be, like, his first real march so on date. The, the, the conventional wisdom a couple weeks ago was that Putin will launch his attack after the Olympics because he doesn't want to offend the Chinese. And then, you know, just late last week, it's like, oh, no, he's going in on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's Wednesday today. He hasn't gone in yeah. yet that I've heard. Uh, my phone hasn't blown up. So, you know, right now it's it's All right. it's a game of, I don't know, it's almost a game of chicken, right? It's like who blinks first. Yeah. And uh, so far nobody has blinked yet. Awesome. This is great. This feels just like, Puda just feels like all my toxic ex-boyfriends, you know? It's just like doesn't want Ukraine to be happy, even though they're trying to get their life together just wants you back anyways Putin needs therapy and then I think everything would be better uh moral of the story that's why I tell all my exes too anyways let's dive into sure yeah so what has Russia been doing because I know they've amassed a lot of troops they've been like yeah. doing some missile stuff I think I don't know what is what have they been doing that's been seen as an attack well I mean, you know, aside from taking over Crimea. Yeah, no, that was a big years one. Ago. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> so the, the recent scare is basically military exercises where more troops than usual are sent to Ukraine's borders and just kept there. And then soldiers are sent into Belarus, uh, a stone's throw from Kiev, basically, uh, to uh, you know, Ukraine's north. And, you know, and then the, all the naval sort of forces accumulated to the south, including troop landing ships that were, you know, sent from, uh, you know, the Baltic seas, right? Sort of relocated back into the Black Sea. So that was a trip. But, you know, they've been massing these forces. And, you know, it's not unlike uh, World War One, right? Where you get sort of a critical mass and you either have to go or you have to, you know, pull back and either uh, suffer the loss of pace or claim some sort of victory. Right. And that is, I think, what the president's trying to do now is trying to offer diplomatic, what they call off, ra off ramps to allow, you know, Putin to stand down from the current, you know, military buildup uh, and proceed with uh, negotiations. Interesting. And I've seen a lot of the Russian spokespeople that have been talking about the issues, and they keep saying that the West is the one that's saying there's going to be a war. They're the one pushing. Yeah the violence and the war to happen and that they yeah, are we'll, just working and c casually chilling out like a fun beach vacation near the border. And it's the West that's really pushing uh, the violence. We're, we're, we're pushing for war by driving, you know, 150,000 Russian troops to the Ukrainian border. That's right. how we're pushing for war. Right. Um, Do you think there's any but, validity to that statement? No. And the more the Russians cry about it, the, 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 that means the, the better we're doing. Interesting. Diplomatically, uh, I think what President Biden has achieved with this frequent sounding the alarm that you know concerns the Russians so much, uh, he's accomplished two things. If Russia does invade, then the world's going to see Russia as the aggressor, correctly so, right. right? And if Russia does not invade, then Biden can credibly claim to have deterred Russia from invading, and that is a difficult thing to do, deter Russia, uh, given Russia's recent track records in various places. Yeah. Let me just add that the other thing that Biden has been doing successfully is uh, rallying support among NATO allies and other allies around the world, um, uh, getting everyone to basically sign on to the idea of unprecedented sanctions that would go into effect. 
Uh, NATO, uh, Biden has said that you know, the United States will not get involved militarily, nor will any other NATO nation, and believe me, no other NATO nation wants to get involved militarily. But they'll still support Ukraine, it should an invasion happen. They'll still be sending arms and weaponry and you know, Yeah, didn't Biden them. say that, but then put troops all around Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine's border? So those are mainly to reassure uh, our NATO allies on Ukraine's border, right? So to settle the Poles, to settle down the Baltic nations, to reassure them, and also signal to Russia that should he start attacking, and he said this uh, the other night with his uh, statement on the situation, uh, we will respond decisively should a NATO country be attacked. And uh, can you just kind of go into and explain a little bit about NATO and why it's so important and also why why uh, Ukraine wants to join it? So NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It, it, it consists of basically the nations that confronted the Soviet Union during most of the Cold War. Uh, and the, the strongest element of NATO is uh, called Article 5. Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty stipulates that an attack on any one country is considered an attack on all the countries. So were Russia to invade Estonia, for example, which is a NATO member, all members of the NATO alliance would respond as if they themselves were attacked. Uh, and in essence, basically that threatens Russia with a very significant chance of escalation to nuclear war should they attack a NATO member. That's why you know Russia is not keen on seeing any other nation, especially on its borders, joining NATO. Right. Uh, they want to have their options open in case something happens on their border, which they consider part of their empire anyway. They don't want to see one. Of the, they don't want to see uh, NATO, uh, Ukraine in particular, join NATO. And I've already explained that there's like zero chance of that happening anytime soon because of what Russia has already done. And you know, I mean, NATO membership was not exactly a popular proposition in Ukraine prior to 2014, but Russia helped make it very popular greatest recruitment poster for NATO membership is President Putin. I'm not going to say Russia, it's President Putin and the action he's taken uh, in recent years. So Article 5 is why Eastern European nations that were part of the Warsaw Pact clamored to join NATO as quickly as possible, and why people who you know live in Estonia are sleeping better at night than people who live in Donetsk. It's, uh, it's you know, whether you're protected by the American nuclear umbrella or not. Interesting. So do you see any world in which Ukraine is invited to join NATO? That's, that's an interesting question. And quote Yogi Berra, it's hard to predict, especially in the future. But if I were to make a prediction, I would say that for Ukraine to join NATO, it would have to mean that there was some sort of new security architecture in Europe in which Russia felt safe and secure. Right? Interesting. I think Russia's legitimate concern about NATO is that you know, in the 1990s, there was no real final settlement of what the post-Soviet, post-Cold War security architecture would look like in Europe. Uh, now, at the time, in the 90s, Russia was incredibly weak. He was suffering hyperinflation and a half-dead uh, drunk man in Boris Yeltsin running the country. So it was not a very energetically run place. And, you know, the United States felt like it was you know, no longer the great power, but it was the unipower. It was like, you know, the... This is the uh, end of history argument from Fukuyama that the you know, liberal democracies have, have prevailed and that's what the world was going to evolve into. And, you know, NATO was just a symbol of joining that club, right? And then maybe Russia one day could aspire to do it itself. That was sort of the thinking back in the day. One day Russia might join. But they actually built up other architectures like so-called Partnership for Peace, which is sort of like nato light, if you will where you are sort of a consulting, contributing member, but you're not actually in the, you know, Article 5 club. Is Ukraine um, part of that or no? You know, it, it was part of that, but then it, the whole thing got sort of tossed aside. Interesting. Uh, it, at, at a certain point when Russia pulled out, it was just real, it was just made defunct. Gotcha. It was it, basically in the early 2000s, uh, President Putin had, had enough. He had, he was willing to, to participate if he was sort of a, on the board of directors of the globe, if you will. Like, Interesting. You know, participating in setting the rules. But Russia kept getting presented with having the proposition of taking the rules that were made somewhere else. And at a certain point, he decided he wasn't having it. Interesting. Uh, and that's when you started to see the emergence of uh, what we call frozen conflicts, where Russia would uh, sort of detach various enclaves from uh, countries. And it's what it calls its near abroad, the former Soviet states. It, served a dual role of sort of 
one, pre preventing them from joining NATO for reasons already explained. You can't join NATO unless you're secure within your borders. But also made sure that, you know, if a government got too close to the West or did things that Russia didn't like, it could sort of heat up what was going on in the frozen conflict and make life difficult for the government in question. Schemey. This is a Very long cool. con, you know. He's it's, been it's, he's been keeping everyone in his back pocket yeah. until when he needs to play the cards. You know, I wouldn't yeah. want to see him at uh, World Series it, of Poker. You know, I mean, he, he does what Russia has done traditionally well over its history. It, it does great in punching above its weight in terms of its what its economy or its military might suggest it's capable of. Interesting. And what Putin has asserted advantages is freedom of action. He can act unilaterally. He doesn't have to answer to his parliament, the Duma. He doesn't really have to answer to public opinion unless things go really wrong, in which case he very much sort of keeps track of what public opinion is. You know, in like the last four or five years, he's really tamped down on domestic opposition in his country. And it's really hard to imagine street protests going out yeah. uh, at any point. Unless there's a lot of casualties coming back from a fight in Ukraine. Interesting. Seems kind of like the catalyst of what's going to happen, of conflict has been bubbling just kind of under the surface. It feels like the past two months is just all rising to see how everyone's going to mm -hmm. act. It's, 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 it's a lot of just the longer we can talk, the less chance there is of actual invasion. Right. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk and talk and talk and, and we'll keep the conversation going because as long as we're talking we're not fighting uh that i think is the, the the current immediate goal and as far as the goal for you know medium to long term it's all about basically and this is the this has been the american policy since uh, 1991 is to keep these former soviet states uh sovereign and independent and secure right right because the last thing we wanted to see and this was in the 90s uh, was for a conflict like Yugoslavia to break out in the former Soviet Union. Right. Because there's a lot more troops, there's a lot more people. And, well, it's not the case anymore, but, you know, back in the 90s, there's also huge nuclear stockpiles in Ukraine and Kazakhstan. So, Interesting. Um, but those those weapons got taken out of both countries. And the, by the mid-90s, the United States and Russia signed a document called the Budapest Memorandum, right. in which both countries promised to respect the sovereignty and integrity of Ukraine. Yeah, how's that Return going? For returning the nuclear <laughs> weapons. So, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't, you know, treaty level document. It wasn't ratified by parliaments, but it was an agreement. So but take that into consideration every time if, every time you hear Putin say that, oh, the United States promised they wouldn't go an inch east with uh, NATO. You know, that was like a conversation with Gorbachev. Like in the early days of getting troops out of Russian troops out of, you know, East Germany. Fascinating. And Gorbachev himself said, you know, said in a paper later on that you know, newly independent states would have would be able to make their own determinations of what treaties and alliances they would join. So, yeah. yeah. So when Putin says that, it's a hot pail of uh, BS. Yeah. The the the, 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 the treaty science, science is real. Term, Putin's response. The scientific term is, the scientific term for what the Russians do is what about is it? Interesting. You point out that you, you you point out something sketchy they're doing, and they say, and the Russians will say, "But what about you doing X, Y, and Z?" Terrible. Oh my things. God, they are so. Russia is so toxic. They're just an emotionally Toxians? abusive boyfriend. Truly. Oh my God. Moral of the story. Guys, we no, need we need to stop. Department. We need to stop dating Russia. And we all go to. So therapy. that was, I would argue, that was American policy throughout the nineties and early two thousands. Yeah. And I was just forget Russia. They don't matter. President Obama called it a declining regional power. Well, that yeah, probably did people, do well for. Yeah. Yeah. What all? What all these people Bang forget is Russia still has the nukes. Russia, you know, can eradicate human life uh, together with us within forty-five minutes of launch at any given moment. But where? Where will they land? Where will they land? Yeah. The Russians don't care. They'll. They'll. Yeah, but how? Nukes. I'm just for myself personally. How far sure. in can they reach into America? They can they can hit every single city, God every single it. square inch. There's no place in the United States where you could go that would be safe. Fuck. Your only hope would be to live in a place that's so remote from anything that it wouldn't be worth targeting it. And then you still die from the fallout. Yeah, that's awesome. You All right. I love that. That makes me feel really good. Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep drinking. Mm -hmm. Anyways. <laughs> So Sometimes that's all I can do. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> is there any world in which 
Because I know Putin's demands have been that Ukraine can never join NATO and also mm-hmm. that NATO pulls back a lot of its forces surrounding Russia and Eastern Europe. Where is the compromise? Where do you think this is going to go? That's that's what all the high priced diplomats are working on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, negotiating not just with the Russians, but with our allies. And, you know, I think this is the moment where we sort of revisit the European security architecture that we didn't do in the 90s. Uh, the best time to have done this was in the 90s, but the second best time is now. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, hopefully we come up with some sort of, you know, agreement about where, you know, conventional arms are placed within, you know, various territories, both in NATO and in Russia, and where, you know, maybe we, we start the International Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty, which, you know, govern the deployment and uh, stationing of uh, you know, nuclear missiles. Maybe we talk a bit about where we position anti-missile defenses. Uh, maybe we don't put them in, you know, Poland and Romania, which we've, we have done, which involves Basically, you know, what we claim is we're going to shoot down the, the ballistic missiles coming out of Iran 20 years from now. Right. But the Russians see that as you know, a direct deterring. Threat. Yeah, basically eliminating uh, the deterrence factor of Russian nuclear weapons hitting European and, and American spots. I just feel like so, the world would be so much better if we just gave everyone Nerf guns and got rid of all the really dangerous stuff, you know? Well, I mean, you see what the Russians did in the Olympics. They'd have, like, personally, you know, PEDs on the nerfs, and uh, they'd be very fatal. So I, I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> You're like, anything that you say can be turned into a direct weapon. I'm awesome. That's right. Um, they'll, they'll tape thumbtacks on the ends of the things right. or something. Who knows? Yeah, they'll put them on your chair, and we'll bring it back to middle school, but everyone will still get wrecked. Um, all right, this is hopeful. I feel good now. Um, so... How have NATO countries been responding? I know Biden has talked mm-hmm. to Russia. The German Chancellor sure. has talked. President mm-hmm. Macron of France has talked. What's happening? Mm-hmm. How do we calm this angry toddler that is known as Vladimir Putin? I don't know that you're going to calm him down, but maybe you can convince him that his interests lay in going a different path than uh, invading Ukraine. And a strong part of that is basically the how other countries are reacting, as you mentioned. So every NATO member has communicated that they stand strong with the alliance, that they support what President Biden is communicating. Um, uh, one, I think Putin really anticipated that this, this crisis would split NATO apart. Uh, it would split the sort of hawkish members from the dovish members, the conflict-averse members from the ones who are, you know, very anti-Russian from recent experience, members like, you know, Poland right. and Romania. Uh, but actually the exact opposite has happened. Uh, they've all drawn together. They're all speaking with one voice, basically, or at least they're speaking in harmony, right, from the same sheet of music. I think one thing that Putin thought that he had accomplished with this uh, pipeline that goes under the Baltic Sea, uh, it's called Nord Stream, which you may have heard of. It supplies uh, natural gas and oil um, with uh, Nord Stream 2. Uh, the plan, I, I mean, you know, right now Germany gets about 40% of its natural gas from Russia. Interesting. Right? Through this pipeline. That pipeline used to go through Ukraine. And Putin, after 2014, decided, you know what, I'm sick of Ukraine being in the position of being able to stop me from earning money by selling gas to Europe. So I'm going to just build this pipeline directly to Germany underwater and you know, eliminate that prospect from ever happening. And so it's been a big sort of point of conflict between the United States and Germany. We keep the Americans say, you know, what do you need that pipeline for? It's just helping Putin. And Interesting. Germany says, hey, we need our gas. We're yeah. <laughs> mind your own business. You and, focus on you. Yeah, mind your own business. This is fine. Come right. on, we've been importing <laughs> gas for decades from, from Russia. Right. It's just not going to go through Ukraine anymore. What's the big deal? Interesting. Well, right now, uh, Germany is saying if Russia goes in, no, no Nord Stream. So the strategy of splitting uh, the alliance apart hasn't worked. There's no daylight between the various NATO members. Interesting. Before. So why does NATO care so much about Ukraine and what happens? Is it because that they are finally kind of turning to democracy and Western mm-hmm. thoughts and they need someone close to Russia? So I think the, the biggest point of concern is the principle of rewriting national boundaries through military action. Interesting. This is sort of what World War II is about. And, you right. know, a couple tens of millions of people died in that conflict. And they don't want to see that happening again. Everything's... Right. 
you know, everything is everyone's a Chamberlain, everything's a Czechoslovakia, everything's an Anschluss when you're when you're sort of debating in terms like this. You can argue that we didn't act uh, forcefully enough when Russia took over Crimea, but you know, I mean, they're, they're, Russia did a good job. We weren't prepared for it. And they did a good job with their diplomatic services in arguing that there was a referendum. And this was traditionally part of the Russian territory anyway, et cetera, et cetera. Gotcha. And basically, you know, a lot of sanctions were imposed, but they were sort of targeted sanctions on individuals and companies that do business with Crimea, et cetera, et cetera. But it wasn't, you know, a, a forceful, very forceful response. Now, Russia's threatening you know, not just little green men, but 150,000 troops ready to go in and potentially, you know, inflict thousands upon thousands of casualties if they actually do go in. Yeah, it calls for a more forceful response. And it's it's not about necessarily whether Ukraine is democratic or not. It's about the principle of security borders. Interesting. And if this is allowed to let slide, then, you know, the next time it happens may not even be Russia. It might be somebody else. Who knows? So they, they want to basically get this principle set down and it's not just about necessarily europe too it's also sending what happened i'm sure beijing is watching very interestingly about what's happening with ukraine and because that will have ramifications for how it treats taiwan right do sanctions really do anything it kind of feels like a slap on the wrist you know what kind of sanctions are putin afraid of i know there's concerns over oil increasing and especially because we're in a really high inflation period right now what's the concern so so here's the thing about sanctions what else are you going to do that's the first question, yeah. right? Uh, the second question about sanctions is how long you got, right? right. Sanctions won't necessarily in- change your behavior the next day, but over you know years and potentially decades, they can work. So people point to, for example, the example of Cuba. Sanctions don't work. Cuba's still communist. We've had sanctions on them for decades and decades. Yeah, the United States has sanctions. Europe does not, for example. So you really need your allies. You need allies on board with the sanctions to make them effective. You can also point to South Africa, right? There are sanctions of, uh, um, slapped on South Africa because of you know apartheid. Interesting. Eventually, they got rid of apartheid. Do you argue that it was that sanctions was a determining factor, or was it basically realizing that this uh, is fucked up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do we want to do it on our terms, or do we want to do it on? those guys terms right. over there that outnumber us so yeah so that well, saying south africa could be put to as a, a sign of sanctions being yes yeah there's only two things that's gonna take putin out and that's father time and mother russia yeah and i feel time like either, time is the more time, time, is where, the time is where the smart money is right he's, he's not a young man He's How old is he? In his late 60s. Really? Because I remember that photo of him riding shirtless on a horse. And I think me especially and a lot of other people were very confused as our attraction as to what we saw. So good to so, know. Yeah, there's well, there's a, there was a Russian pop song back in the day <laughs> called I Want a Man Like Putin. Yeah. Literally. So, you know, that's a fun song. You can put that on YouTube. I want a terrible man, like man rode that horse like no other. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, usually he's riding the bear, right? That's right. The other we'll take what we can get. So, where do you see this conflict going? You know, there's so much up in the air. By this time, this yeah. podcast airs, everything could have changed. Sure. But uh, everything could have changed. Let me. So I'm going to do like the 20 years from now. Yeah. Answer to that question. All right. Deal. Okay. Deal. So, first of all, I don't think Russia is going to actually invade with its military, and I'm going to look like a fool if they do, but. <laughs> Choose to be an optimism, and, and we'll be sad or prove, prove it wrong. Right. But sad because of the event, not because I was wrong. No, it'd be sad because okay. it'd be terrible and disastrous. Because it's tragic. It'll be yeah, really it'd tragic be on an epic scale. I, right. I also think that whether or not Putin invades, but especially if he does invade, he has broken the bonds between Russia and Ukraine, not just in political terms, but in terms of civilization. You know, I was talking about the thousand-year shared civilization of family, culture, right. language, uh, although Ukraine and Russian are slightly different, they are very related. All that goes back, again, a thousand years. Last hundred years or so, though, there's been some issues coming from, you know, and this, a lot of this was in the Soviet era, but, you know, so Team Russia, Kremlin Moscow, you know, they presided over a famine in Ukraine in the early 1930s that the Ukrainians called the Hole of the Mer, which like seven million people arguably perished. Wow. By famine. Fast forward, you know, uh, you know, the World War II was a was a whole other you know mess, right? Uh, a lot of the ending days of the war were, were about sort of suppressing Ukrainian 
nationalists as much as fighting the Germans for the Soviet army. Interesting. And that was a bloody. Fast forward a little bit further. Uh, April 1986, a you know, nuclear power plant that the you know, Moscow had directed to be built in a town outside of a little town outside of Chernobyl that exploded. You may have heard of it, Chernobyl. Uh, you know, the Russians in Moscow hid the news. They sat on the news. And days later, there was marches all over the country of Ukraine on the traditional May Day Parade, like, you know, some six days later. Uh, Ukrainians never really got over that either. But so those are just a few historical complaints from recent decades against Russia coming up into 2014. But bear in mind that up until 2014, Ukrainians still had a widely popular opinion about Russia and towards Russia. They, they wanted to study in Russia. They wanted to work in Russia. The, the inner you know, family ties were still there. But then comes the Crimea annexation. And then comes the war, the separatist war in the east. And there's 14,000 casualties in that war to date. Uh, that's that's taken a, a kind of a toll. And Russia, not very popular right now. That makes sense. Uh, I would fact, get that. In fact, <laughs> you, you can Google Ukraine Putin song after this. Will do. And so in soccer matches, they, they sing this song. It's basically la, 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 uh, Putin huilo, which basically is Putin is a dickhead. <laughs> and you, you've not heard fun things until you hear tens of thousands of people chanting that. And they chant it in the soccer fields and in, 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 um, in marches. Short and sweet. And it's just a I like how it gets it's to a the lot point. Of it. I think it's, you know, they, they may have wanted to enter it in the Eurovision competition, but uh, it's probably weren't allowed hilarious. to. Hilarious. Uh, another factor is that the you know they have a shared church, the Orthodox Church, right? That was headed up uh, in the Moscow Patriarch, but the Ukrainian Church gained its gained an independent church, and so now there's a united independent Orthodox Church that drove Putin crazy when that happened. The Russians were extremely mad about that. See, but I'm Jewish. Is, if another... he was Jewish, he probably wouldn't feel that way. So maybe he should convert. Uh, well, you could suggest it to him next time. Yeah, you next him. time I'd be like, hey, buddy, should I just tweet at him? See how it goes. <laughs> anyway, so these are, again, these are civilizational ties that are breaking down between the Russians and the Koreans. If Putin invades and, like, you know, tens of thousands more casualties happen overnight and right. cities are wrecked and what have you, uh, it's going to be impossible for the, let alone Putin, it's going to be possible for the next leader of Russia to sort of restore those ties. Right. I think that will be just a major civilizational break that's, will endure well past, you know, our lifetimes. Right. God, this is heavy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's awful because no matter what, hopefully this is just a big giant bluff and Putin's just trying to wave his dick around and get people to acknowledge it. But if he <laughs> actually takes action, there could be life-changing for hundreds of thousands of people. And it's not just a conflict that has been kept to Ukraine, right? I mean, remember the Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, Yes. Which shot I, down in, in 2014 and over 200 people died in that. Yeah, which that I was saw. was fired by Russian separatists. Yeah, and I saw that there's like currently no flights over Ukraine right now because people are so nervous. Yeah, I'm amazed there were flights before this, to be honest. I mean, who'd want to fly over that section of Ukraine ever? In fact, I don't think there are flights over that little patch of Ukraine. Right. Now it's over the whole country. What a clusterfuck. <laughs> I believe that is a technical term. Yeah, the scientific term is a, a clusterfuck. Um, feel free to quote me on that one. Um, but uh, any other comments, any other things we should keep a lookout for as this whole situation materializes in the next couple of days, weeks? Well, I will say, don't listen to what the Russians say. Watch what they do. That's the main thing. Interesting. Okay. The Russians might say they're moving forces. Don't believe it until you know the satellite imagery confirms it. That's the first thing. Second thing is keeping calm is important, as you, I think Ukraine has it exactly right. Uh, they're trying to keep the population calm. Uh, panic is only going to help uh, President Putin sort of destroy things. Uh, I will also point out, if, and I'm sure somebody's telling Putin this, that Ukra Ukrainians are actually pretty good at partisan warfare. Um, you know, just reference World War II. Right. <laughs> And that's where a lot of the powers of warfare was being fought. If there's if there's an invasion, it'll be fast, furious, and decisive by the Russians. But holding it's an entirely different thing. You think and NATO's going to come in and it, fight, though? No, you know? NATO will not come in and fight. No, NATO will send stuff over, kind of like they're they not going to send troops back in the day. But we're not going to send troops. No, I don't know. Interesting. Well, yeah, awesome. 
This just feels yeah. like the world is stepping on one giant Lego. <laughs> and and not not like the nice flat Lego. No, like no, this Lego has spikes and is just royally destroying everything. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully this Lego puts its dick away and realizes that this is not for the greater good of society and its ego chills out. You and I have very different Legos. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a generation thing. <laughs> I have no other questions. Is there anything else you would like to add? When this crisis does blow over, the main thing to remember is that this is a Putin conflict. This is not a Russia conflict. So I think going forward, and, and policymakers from Biden to Senator Warner say this the other night, we're not in conflict with the Russian people. Totally. And the more we emphasize that, the better it will be for long-term relations with, with Russia. And I don't mean Putin, I mean Russia. And there will be eventually a post-Putin Russia. We're not going to have great relations with Putin, but we need to lay the groundwork for good relations with Russia or at least normal neighborly relations with Russia. Absolutely. That's what we have to work for, I think, for the future. Absolutely. So again, long term. Totally. Short term, drink beer. Short term, drink beer. I don't know, cry a little bit. And hopefully we'll be fine. Uh, but long term, don't be racist is really kind of what we're getting at. And don't be an asshat what? to people yeah. because they're from these a are, different country. It's all valid pieces of advice. No racism, no asshattery. It's all good. Yeah. No, yeah. no, this you is basically a self help podcast. <laughs> but uh yeah no this has been wonderful thank you so much for talking to us um thank you for breaking everything down because it's certainly very overwhelming to hear and you've provided a lot of clarity and so once again i'm emily gross your host of bureaucracy here with joe dressen we'll be back talking about another issue going on in the world and visit the Kennan Institute website uh, yes. on, on, on twitter facebook and our website uh, we have a Hindsight Upfront Ukraine, where we have a lot of content and commentary about things going on in Ukraine, where smarter people than I break everything down. And it's nonpartisan, which is so important right now. So go check it out. Absolutely nonpartisan. Yes, go check it out. Go educate yourselves. So everyone, be safe, be well. And uh, thank you so much and have a wonderful day.